Hey guys, what is up? Welcome back to another video. I've missed you guys so much. I cannot believe how long I've been gone. It most certainly was not the way I had planned to start off the new year, but hi, hello, good day. I'm finally back. I finally beat it. And thankfully I can say that I have mostly recovered. Quick heads up, I've got a lot to say at the beginning of this video. So if you're not interested in that and you're just here for the story, then go ahead and skip to this timestamp right here. Otherwise, you've been warned. First things first, if you missed my last few community posts and you're confused as to where the heck I've been, it got me. I managed to dodge it for two whole years, but one week into 2022, it finally caught me. Which honestly, I feel like happened to so many people. My God, I feel like everyone had it right around the same time I did. And even though I'd consider my case to have been mild since I was able to manage it at home, I was out of commission for a good two weeks. Then I had to spend like a week trying to catch my life back up and get into some sort of functioning order and it's been a mess. But like I said, I'm here, I'm back. And in the grand scheme of things, I know that I'm incredibly lucky to have been able to manage the experience from the comfort of my own home and that I'm extremely fortunate to be through it and to be feeling much better. With that said, I do wanna thank you all so much for your patience and your well wishes while I was gone. Everyone was so sweet and supportive through my absence and it really, really helped keep my spirits up. I cannot even begin to express just how much I appreciate you all. Which, speaking of gratitude, brings me right into my next point. Right before I posted my last video, we met and have actually since well exceeded our 1000 subscriber goal. And that is just absolutely bananas to me. I still can't wrap my head around it. You guys are truly amazing and I cannot thank you enough. Whether you've been here since the beginning or you've just joined us recently, I always want you to know that your support means the world to me. The fact that you all took the time to subscribe, the fact that you choose to stay subscribed, and the fact that I'm fortunate enough to get to spend some time with you all each week is just incredibly humbling. I am so thankful that after years of toying with the idea, I finally started a channel. And that because of it, we've been able to build such a wonderful community of friends. So thank you guys all, again, truly from the bottom of my heart for being here. Engaging with you guys and getting to know you all will never not be incredibly fun and exciting for me. I talked in one of my most recent community posts about doing a Q&A video, kind of as a way for you guys to get to know me personally a little better. And I got a lot of really good questions in response to that. So I'll definitely be filming that here in the next few days. I had super unrealistic plans of grandeur to film, edit, and upload that as well as this video this week. But I've come to realize that for my first week back from the Rona, that might have been a little overly ambitious. But I do plan to try and film that video here in the next few days. So if you have any last minute questions you'd like to slip in, please feel free to leave those in the comments down below. Let's see where I've been. You guys are amazing. Q&A. Yeah, that about covers it. If by chance you're new here and you actually decided to stick around through all that rambling, um, hi. Thank you so much for clicking on this video and committing to all of that. I'm so happy that you're here. My name is Jessica and welcome to my channel where I explore new true crime or creepy history topics each week. If that sounds like something you're interested in and you'd like to join me back here each week, go ahead and subscribe to my channel down below. Lastly, before I get into today's case, please take a minute to look at the screen for a list of sensitive topics that will either be covered or heavily implied in today's story. If any of these are topics that you are not in the headspace to hear about right now, then this is not the video for you. Please do what is best for you. That will always be the most important thing to me. If that means you're headed out, I completely understand, and I'm sure that I will catch you back here very soon for a different case. Otherwise, if you're sticking around, let's go ahead and get started. Casey Renee Woody was born on October 17th, 1989 in Little Rock, Arkansas to her parents, Rick and Christy Woody. She was their youngest child and their only daughter preceded by her older brothers, Austin and Timothy. So she was definitely the princess of the family. I mean, she was the baby and the only girl. That's like a coveted spot. Despite being born in Little Rock, Casey primarily grew up in Holland, Arkansas, which is a very small rural town about 50 miles outside of Little Rock. And when I say very small and very rural, 
I mean it. At the time our story takes place, Holland had a population of just about 500 people. So we're talking like small, small. Her family lived in a little house at the end of a really long dirt road and they were surrounded by nothing other than woods. Her neighbors were all located at least an acre away, which created a really quiet and peaceful environment that was far removed from the hustle and bustle of a big city. The Woody family was living a perfectly normal and quiet life when sadly on June 19th, 1997, an unexpected tragedy would change everything. That night, the family was driving home from one of the boys' baseball games when, out of nowhere, two wild horses ran into the middle of the road right in front of their vehicle. Despite his best efforts, Rick could not stop the car in time to avoid a collision, and sadly, Christy Woody was killed on impact. Obviously, this was completely devastating for the entire family, but it was especially gut-wrenching for Casey, who was just seven years old, when she was forced to witness the death of her mother firsthand. I have to assume that growing up without a mother is one of the hardest things on earth for any little girl to have to go through, but for her to have lost her mother so traumatically and right in front of her own eyes, I cannot even begin to imagine the mark that that left on her. Not to mention that Christie's death was just tragically ironic. She had spent her entire life working passionately with horses, an interest that she was just beginning to share with Casey. But understandably, following the accident, Casey began to absolutely hate horses. However, even through these complex feelings, Casey still chose to keep and display Christie's collection of horse figurines as a desperate way to keep her memory alive. Through the loss of her mother, Casey grew extremely close with her father, who, despite having a demanding job as a Greenbrier police officer, did his absolute best to fill both parental roles. And Rick's hard work and dedication as a parent really seemed to pay off. As she grew into her adolescence, Casey seemed to be a really well-adjusted girl. She was consistently on the honor roll at Greenbrier Middle School. She was known for being lively and friendly, and she was absolutely adored by her friends. Everyone who knew Casey said that she brought joy and laughter with her wherever she went. To know her was to love her. Despite the horrible things she'd experienced during her early childhood, Casey genuinely was happy and enjoying her life. However, as she got older, she started to realize just how small her town was. And naturally, she began to wonder what else might be out there beyond Holland. How much world really existed outside of what she already knew. Now, I don't think it's outside of the scope of reality to assume that everyone has experienced this type of curiosity at some point through their teenage years. You know, you're finally old enough to comprehend that your world and your universe are just the beginning. And that beyond that, there is still so, so much that you have yet to discover and experience. But the problem nowadays, well, mostly since the internet took over the world, is that young kids and teenagers can now experience some of these things way before they're ready, far before they're old enough to understand that while, yes, it can be intriguing and vast and beautiful, the world can also be an incredibly scary and dangerous place. That you really do have to be so, so careful with the situations you put yourself in. But when you're young and naive and just barely starting to figure things out, it's almost impossible to fully comprehend those dangers. You're too busy seeing the world through rose-colored glasses, not to mention falsely believing that you're mature and that you know everything. It's all just a real recipe for disaster. I can tell you for a 100% fact that when I was a teenager, I was definitely doing dumb shit on the internet that I shouldn't have been. And while I don't remember doing anything that could have ever put me in any real danger, I can easily see how a vulnerable young girl could fall into a trap and not even realize it until it was too late. And unfortunately, that is exactly what happened to Casey Woody. Because her oldest brother had moved out, her other brother was in night school, and her dad basically worked around the clock to support them, Casey found herself home alone and bored 
a lot. She lived far away from her friends. Her neighbors were so far away that they could barely be considered neighbors. And because she lived so far off the beaten path, she couldn't even make very many phone calls because any call she did make was likely going to be considered long distance. And once you find out all of those things, it becomes pretty simple to understand why Casey was feeling so uneasy. She was a social butterfly, but she was essentially isolated from the world around her. And Rick took notice of this. He could tell that his daughter was desperately craving social interaction. So obviously the trendiest and easiest solution at the time was to install dial-up internet. Y'all remember dial-up internet? God, what a time to be alive, am I right? Anyways, Rick had dial-up internet installed and he gave Casey permission to use an online instant messenger to more easily communicate with her friends. And just like the rest of us in the early 2000s, Casey was instantly hooked. The internet opened up a whole new world for her. Suddenly, she wasn't so isolated. With the click of a mouse, she could be anywhere and talk to anyone, basically at any time. The possibilities were virtually endless. But even with the world at her fingertips, her internet usage really did start off innocently enough. At first, she genuinely was just messaging her close friends from school. But eventually, as the novelty wore off, she and her friends decided to branch out a bit. It was New Year's Eve 2001 when Casey and her friends Sam and Jessica got bored and decided to try their luck finding some entertainment in a chat room. For anyone that grew up after the AIM era, a chat room is a place where just a bunch of random people from all over the internet would live chat with each other. The conversations were usually supposed to be centered around a specific predetermined topic, but no matter the topic assigned, it usually didn't take long for the conversation to shift and for things to get weird. Or maybe I was just in like all the wrong chat rooms when I was growing up. But imagine joining a giant group text full of a bunch of random people you don't know. It's bound to go sideways at some point. But Casey's father was a cop. He'd made sure to have plenty of conversations with her regarding internet safety. He didn't just hand her the World Wide Web and turn her loose without so much as a warning. So Casey and her friends made sure to carefully choose a chat room that felt safe to them, ultimately deciding on one for Christian teens. Now, remember, it's New Year's Eve. Most people were off hanging out with their families or at parties. Not many people tend to spend that night in particular plastered to their computer screens. So the chat room wasn't like, super bumping, but there were still enough participants to make it fun for the girls. Little did they know that this very chat room would eventually change their lives forever. Because it was in this chat room that Casey first met and began speaking with a boy named Dave. Or Jazzman underscore DF. Oh my god, please take a second and comment down below what dumb usernames you used to use for like AIM and stuff. Oh, I would love to see that. This was always mine, so like, <laughs> hit me up. Anyways, Dave introduced himself as a 17-year-old boy from California, and Casey was immediately intrigued. I mean, what 12-year-old girl wouldn't be? He was older, he was from a big city, he surfed, he quite literally seemed to embody the exact excitement that Casey had been yearning for. And as if that wasn't all amazing enough, Dave was also really sweet and funny and their personalities just seemed to mesh really well with one another. And from New Year's Eve on, they began to develop a pretty strong bond. Eventually, they were speaking every day, multiple times a day, and Dave was very quickly becoming a really important person in Casey's life. They shared details of their deepest secrets and their darkest traumas. Casey confided in him about what had happened to her mom, and she felt comfortable talking openly and freely about how much she missed her. And surprisingly, this was a topic that Dave could actually empathize with all too well. Following learning about Casey's mom, Dave confided in her that he actually had an aunt who was currently in a coma following her own very serious car accident. And even more coincidentally, if you can believe it, his aunt just so happened to be hospitalized in none other than Arkansas. Small world, huh? Almost a little too small, if you catch my drift. But Casey didn't see it this way. Instead, she believed that their shared experiences just 
bonded them even further. She would talk to anyone who would listen about just how wonderful her new friend Dave was. And she even convinced her friends to start friendships with him because she thought he was just that incredible. If you're wondering, yes, Rick did know about Dave. And it really didn't bother him at first that Casey was talking to boys on the internet. He felt as though it was all in good fun and just kind of part of the whole teenage experience. He figured as long as it stayed on the internet, it probably wasn't dangerous. It wasn't until a few months into their friendship, when Casey mentioned to her father that Dave had recently turned 18, that Rick began to change his tune. He was relatively unbothered when he thought Casey was talking to boys her own age, but when he found out that the boy she'd been spending so much time corresponding with was now technically an adult man, he asked that she discontinue their communication. He wasn't mad at her and she wasn't like in trouble or anything. He simply told her that he didn't mind her being on the internet or even chatting with boys, but that he wanted to make sure that she was being safe by only talking to boys who were age appropriate. Unfortunately though, as I think we all know, teens will be teens. And despite her dad's request, Casey maintained her friendship with Dave in secret while continuing to peruse and enjoy the internet. After meeting and finding such an amazing friendship in a chat room, Casey continued to utilize chat rooms to look for other friends or other people to talk to. And it was during this time that Casey met and began regularly chatting with another boy named Scott. Scott was 14 and living in Atlanta, Georgia, and much like she had with Dave, Casey really seemed to hit it off with him right away. For a brief moment, Casey actually felt guilty about her friendship with Scott and kind of felt stuck between he and Dave. But considering their ages and the fact that she was actually allowed to be speaking with Scott, she ultimately chose to pursue a deeper relationship with him, even going so far as to begin calling him her boyfriend. But Casey's change in relationship status didn't seem to bother Dave. He wasn't mad at her for pursuing a new relationship and he assured her that he still wanted to be friends. And this was really relieving to Casey until very shortly thereafter, Dave turned around and began really pushing her to escalate their friendship. He informed her that his aunt's condition was getting worse and that she really wasn't expected to make it much longer. Because of this, he was planning to come to Arkansas soon to visit her in the hospital. And he figured that this could be an ideal opportunity to take their friendship beyond the keyboard and to meet face to face. An idea that Casey was not into at all. She'd never had any plans to ever take their friendship beyond the internet, let alone now that she was romantically involved with someone else. So when Dave propositioned her with this meetup, she promptly turned the offer down and decided that it might actually be a good idea to start distancing herself from him slightly. Now, ironically, at this exact same time, Casey's friends were actually feeling uneasy about her relationship with Scott. While they'd always supported her friendship with Dave, they felt like she was not exercising the same common sense when it came to Scott. They thought she was just moving way too fast with him. They'd only been chatting for like a week when she started calling him her boyfriend. And basically immediately after that, she began constantly telling everyone just how much she loved him. Personally, to me, this just sounds like textbook teen or preteen romance. If memory serves me correctly, most middle and early high school relationships tend to progress at this like land speed record breaking rate. So honestly, calling him her boyfriend and saying that she loved him is really neither here nor there to me. Where I completely agree with her friend's disapproval of the relationship was when they found out that Casey had broken like the number one cardinal rule of internet safety. Casey had apparently given her new beau her address so they could exchange letters and photos. And frankly, her friends were pissed. They told her that it was super irresponsible to give her address out to someone she'd never met in person before. Further teasing her by saying that Scott could easily be like an 80 year old man using pictures of his grandson to pretend to be a teenager. And honestly, MTV has proven time and time again that they weren't necessarily wrong. But regardless of if she really believed he was who he said he was or not, no child should ever be giving out any personal information to anyone on the internet, especially their home address. And unfortunately, her friends were right to worry because on December 3rd, 2002, Casey's internet usage caught up with her in the most nightmarish way imaginable. The evening started off like any other Tuesday night had before. Her brother left for his night classes and her father left for work. 
once again leaving her home alone. Like always, Rick called her to check on her around seven o'clock that evening. She answered right away. They spoke briefly and everything was fine, like it always was. However, things took a dramatic turn when her brother arrived home from school around 11 p.m. to find that his little sister was gone. Remember, Casey was only 13 at this time, so she didn't hop in her car and quickly go to run an errand. And she lived acres away from her nearest neighbors. So she hadn't stepped out and into one of their homes briefly. No, her not being home was definitely weird and her brother had a bad feeling about it right away. Once he was sure that she was definitely nowhere in the house, he called his dad. He figured best case scenario, he'd know where Casey was. And if not, worst case scenario, he was a cop. So at least he'd know what to do next. And upon hearing from his son, knowing that there was absolutely no reason that Casey shouldn't be home, Rick too became concerned for Casey's safety and rushed home. He tried desperately to convince himself that there had to be some sort of logical explanation that he just wasn't thinking of. Surely his daughter was fine, but deep, deep down as he drove back to the house, he knew that there was more to the situation than that. He knew his daughter too well, and he just didn't believe that she'd go somewhere voluntarily without telling him. She was a really good kid, and she would never risk worrying everyone like that. Something about the situation was very, very wrong. Suspicions that were confirmed when he began looking around the house and realized that Casey's shoes, glasses, and jacket were all still there. These were items he knew that on the off chance she had taken off on her own volition, she most certainly would have taken with her. He knew he needed to call the police right then and there and report his daughter missing. Rick's peers dispatched immediately to the home where they noted signs of forced entry, as well as evidence that a struggle had broken out in the living room. These things combined seemed to imply that Casey had tried to fight off an abductor before she was ultimately overpowered and forcibly taken from the home. Following this preliminary search, police issued a statewide alert regarding Casey's disappearance and begging the public for information. They also began a pretty widespread search in hopes of locating Casey, or at the very least, more evidence as to where she may have been taken. But the real leads didn't come until police finally got a chance to sit down and interview Casey's friends because it was while speaking to Samantha Mann and Jessica Bradford that police finally learned of Casey's online relationship. They told police all about Casey's new boyfriend, Scott, making extra sure to mention that she'd recently given him her address. To which police are like, we gotta track down this Scott character. And by tracing his username, they were able to do so within just 12 hours of Casey's disappearance. Local law enforcement dispatched to his Atlanta, Georgia residence where they were greeted at the door by a middle-aged woman. And when they asked to speak to Scott, the woman called into the house and the next thing police knew, they were standing face to face with the very same young man pictured in the photos Casey had shown her friends of her boyfriend, Scott. He was in fact a real boy. And not only was he really who he claimed to be, he also had an airtight alibi that immediately ruled him out of having anything to do with Casey's disappearance. And just like that, police were back to square one, but not for long. Once Casey's friends learned that Scott was really who he claimed to be, they decided it was probably time to come clean about the fact that Casey had still been secretly talking to Dave behind her father's back and that just before her disappearance, Dave had been very persistent in trying to set up a face-to-face -face meeting with Casey during his upcoming trip to Arkansas. Yeah, now things were starting to click. Desperate to follow this lead, police began searching hotels and motels in the area for anyone they might be able to track down by the name of Dave or David. It took several tries at various different locations before they finally happened to stumble across a man named David. David Fuller, to be exact. And coincidentally, this Mr. Fuller happened to be in town from California. Obviously the name wasn't the exact same, but it still seemed too coincidental to ignore. And their suspicions only grew as the hotel manager gave police the rundown on Mr. Fuller. He informed them that he'd arrived on December 2nd with a reservation to stay for a whole week. He'd requested no maid service for the duration of his stay. And almost immediately after checking in, he started complaining about the quality of the hotel's internet. Unfortunately though, Mr. Fuller had left the building. He wasn't there and it really didn't look as if he had been recently. The bed didn't appear to have been slumped in and the room seemed 
fairly untouched. However, inside they did find some articles of camouflage clothing as well as some rubber gloves. It should go without saying that these discoveries didn't exactly give police the warmest of fuzzies. So they took the limited information that they had on David Fuller and they started digging, quickly determining that they were in fact not dealing with a teenage boy, but rather a 47 year old man. A 47 year old man that was married, was a father, and was very much not a teenage California dreamboat. And using his credit card information, they also learned that he'd recently rented a unit at a storage facility in town. They couldn't be sure, but at this point, police really felt like they were onto something. So they followed their gut and they made their way to the storage facility. Once on the scene, they surrounded and secured the area before making their way to the specific unit that David had rented. And when they got to David's unit, they found that the roll-up door was shut, but that the lock had not been secured, which led them to believe that maybe David was trying to hide inside. So they announced their presence and ordered him, if inside, to surrender. But rather than the unit opening, the next thing police heard was a single gunshot. Now police knew that someone was hiding in the unit and more alarming than that, they obviously now knew that this person was armed. In the blink of an eye, they found themselves tangled up in what they now believe to be a critical hostage situation. They called in a SWAT team as well as a specially trained hostage negotiator. And for over three hours, the negotiation team tried to coax their suspect out of the storage unit. However, when they continued to receive absolutely no response from inside the unit, they eventually decided to take control of the situation and storm the unit. And once inside, they were unfortunately faced with the fact that they'd simply been too late. On December 4th, 2002, inside the storage unit in Conway, Arkansas, authorities found the body of 13-year-old Casey Woody. But the gunshot that took her life was not the gunshot that police had heard when they'd first arrived on the scene. Because that gunshot had actually been David Fuller taking the coward's way out after realizing he was caught. The subsequent investigation into Casey's abduction turned up some pretty disturbing information. Police were able to determine that David had actually visited Arkansas prior to the abduction in order to formulate a plan. He'd vetted out motels, he located the storage unit ahead of time, and it's even believed that David had stalked and spied on Casey as part of his demented preparation. An examination of Casey revealed that she'd been subdued with chloroform during her abduction, and it's assumed that she was likely unconscious from the time she was kidnapped to the time she was killed. And I hope this doesn't sound callous, but I kind of hope that was the case. I'm sorry, but I just honestly feel like that sounds like best case scenario. No one deserves to experience that kind of fear. The investigation into David's background further uncovered what a garbage person he was. He'd been accused of domestic violence. He'd been previously arrested for exposing himself to young girls. He'd been fired from his job as a car salesman because he was caught watching porn at work. And police discovered that he'd actually attempted to use his David Fagan persona with at least three other young girls. A search of his apartment turned up a framed collage of pictures of Casey near his computer, which turned out to be the very same computer that he'd used to communicate with Casey while posing as Dave. So I guess if his goal was to avoid prison time, he made the right call because his dumbass left behind a mountain of extremely incriminating evidence. If Casey was alive today, she'd be 32 years old, but sadly her life was cut short by this horrible monster of a man before it ever really got the chance to begin. Casey's funeral was held on December 9th, 2002. She was laid to rest in South Crossroads Church Cemetery right next to her mother. While Casey may no longer be with us, it's important to know that her legacy lives on through her father and her best friends. Casey was incredibly passionate about helping people, which is something Rick says he will never forget about his daughter. And to honor this in the wake of their tragedy, Rick and Casey's friends set up the Casey Woody Foundation, an organization that is dedicated to educating and informing children of the potential dangers the internet holds. They refused to let their loss be for nothing, and personally, I find that to be super inspiring. The ability to harness your grief and channel it down such an important avenue takes an enormous amount of strength, and their cause is truly an admirable one. And with that, we're about wrapped for today. Let me know your thoughts on this case in the comments down below. 
As always, I thank you so much for taking the time to watch this video and to listen to this story. Before you head out, make sure you give this video a thumbs up. It only takes a second and it really helps out the channel a lot, so thanks in advance. If you haven't already and you'd like to, go ahead and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime or creepy history content each week, and I'd love to catch you back here in my next video. If you want to make sure you don't miss my next video, you should probably turn on the post notifications for the channel. I try really hard to post on Fridays each week, but I'd be lying if I said I was reliable with that. So having the notifications on will help make sure that you're notified as soon as I do upload. But until then, stay safe and have a good week. Bye guys.